three. Um, so, um, yes, I, I am tomorrow and I work at the SCI here. And this is a set of presentations that I've developed to help people get a good understanding about zero trust security. Um, here's the agenda that I'm going to follow, but we'll have some spaces that we can uh, take a breath and give you a chance to think about things. Uh, and let me get this out of the way. I got one thing in the middle of the screen. Okay, so Zero Trust is a, a security model developed by John Kindervog when he was at Forrester. This back in 2009. And the two basic goals were to remove implicit trust in the network, as well as moving security from the network to the actual users, their application, the workloads, the devices they use. Okay, um, here's some additional principles that we are very important to please keep in mind. So you want to be sure that you, any, any resource that has tried to be accessed can be done securely. So you focus on a least privilege strategy. And the other thing is a strong emphasis on access control. Another, the, the tenants for zero trust is to inspect and log all traffic. Um, the, the, the move towards application programming interface for data and event exchange is very important because the, the, the desire to automate these processes, make it more dynamic. And kind of talk about that in the, the next bullet here is automating actions. So I think when we talk about zero trust, I think context and the events that happen are very important. And I think this is why System of systems, system viewpoint are very important to understand when somebody tries to apply a zero trust security tenant and develop an architecture for that. And the, the last thing is to show value. So a lot of our customers are DOD and um, federal agencies, but also commercial organizations. And so I think this information will be helpful. And I think some of the, 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 um, we're going to talk about it as your trust journey, an approach that we're developing to help transition and get people thinking about zero trust. And one of the key things that we always know is we have to show that value. Um, so a zero trust system is important to think about as an integrated security platform that uses contextual information. And it's not it's identity, security, as well as the IT infrastructures. It, I'm sorry, risk and analytic tools. So these are all inputs that would be combined together to, to move to a more of a dynamic enforcement of security policies. So I think sometimes you've heard people say zero trust is kind of the reusing principles we've heard in the past, you know, having multi-factor identification, know what assets I have on my network. Um, and um least privilege. But the thing is, I think is really different here is focusing on that dynamic enforcement of security policies and being able to take in a number of different inputs into that, that contextual information and being able to apply risk assessment to this. This is what's new and different. And I think this is one area that once we get people familiar with the different approaches for zero trust that discussed and start to put together their systems and system of systems, I think this is what's going to be an exciting research area. So again, zero trust moves from that perimeter based defense to more of a resource and identity centric model. And the idea is to be able to continuously adapt access controls. So this is that contextual information again coming in. Um, Another thing is thinking about like any devices on your network, you know, assessing their configurations or do you have the latest patches on there? Different, there's a lot of different aspects that can go into this dynamic policies that you can use to, you know, allocate access control. Here's some other more specific things, and I, I hope you guys won't get lost in some of these areas. This is more uh, we talk about in the networking side of things, but you know these are all the same platform requirements. But I guess you take these with a grain of salt because we know anytime you go with a, a, a weapon system or an enterprise or somebody's infrastructure in the cloud, it, you 
zero trust is not something that you just say, I have to do everything here. So this is where you have to make, be aware of what is going on and then be able to justify your decisions. So we'll go through some of these requirements, but these are some of the trade-offs that you, once you have a good understanding of your system and its actions, then you can decide how you want to address these, these types of requirements. First one is data playing communications must be encrypted. So I think the, the thing that people are very familiar with is about DNS and the problems with that. So making sure you, you make a deliberate decision on how you're addressing or using DNS in your system and where you get your sources from is important. Um, the thing is being able to enforce access controls for all resources. So it's not like I can log into my system, have multi-factor authentication, and have free access to things. Now, this is saying that you need to be able to request access or have access granted to you if you want to access a database, print out a file, move to a different system. That This is adding a layer of control to your security. So data resources need to be protected. And it, again, they're highlighting that identity and contextual policies. So we're gonna keep hearing that word policies a lot. And it's the, the need to be able to adapt those in a relatively dynamic manner to be able to provide this idea of zero trust security. So the, the system and security model I mean, for securing all the users, it doesn't matter whether you're sitting at home, if I'm on my phone, if I'm logged into the cloud or on-premise things, you have to have something in place for all the different types of users. And that's a part of what, you know, by applying this philosophy and updating these policies that you can simplify or make it easier for your security team to then focus on real problems. And this is starting to, I mean, it goes along the lines of least privilege. Um, I, I mentioned in the beginning, devices must be inspected for their security posture and configuration prior to granting access. Uh, so one thing it was raised to is being able to distinguish BYOD from corporate managed devices. So it's very important to know what device is trying to access what, and you would have different policies on what could be done with that device. Um, seven here is we're talking again about explicitly granted by policy access to any type of device. And again, this is getting away from that VPN mode where people just log in and have free reign to the network. Another thing, that, and I think these are some of the things that start to get a little bit more challenging or more mature organizations are not going to have to work too, is being able to distinguish between different types of service for the same network device and have your access controls be able to manipulate on that. Uh, so, yeah, the, in, it is specified. So accessing different data elements, whether it's in an application, it's in containers. I mean, this is, again, another thing that, you know, a lot of times people have a sense of what their data architecture is and who should access that. But it needs to be tied into that, the business policies and to be able to enforce that. Ten talks about network traffic metadata. And I think this is what you're starting to see when people are using HTTPS and they're not able to do break, break and inspect on their network connections. So you're going to have to look into the metadata aspects to see and get more of that security information that people were used to have when they had the break and inspect. So again, we're talking about network traffic have to be able to be examined for security and data loss purposes. So that kind of ties in with what we just mentioned is visibility and understanding your network, the information you're looking at, looking to obtain to use for your security operations is real important from an architectural aspect to, to have that understanding and be able to convey that to people. And a big push to move to the cloud. So in zero trust security, it doesn't matter whether it's in the cloud or on-premise. You need to have access controls and policies in place to support where those, wherever those workloads are. The last couple were 
focusing again on automation and being able to provide that contextual information. And I think that that's an exciting area that people will be looking and working in in the, in the near term here. And logs is something that's it's very important. And I think we see as we work with our customers, it's very hard for especially large organizations to consolidate that their log information so that their security operations can look at it and look across all that information. I think that's an initial step that people have to work on in improving their logging systems to be able to then move into the or make the effort to go to zero trust security and the dynamic enforcement of policies. So I'd, I'd take a break there. I was wondering, is there any questions so far? Okay, I didn't hear anything, so I'll keep going. So. This is the, one of the first models. This was presented by Forrester, uh, Kinder Jag. And you can see the focus from their point of view was on data. And then data is ties into devices, networks, workloads, and people. And there's two cross-cutting areas, the visibility analytics, automation, and orchestration. And I think when you're out there looking at the commercial zero trust market, a lot of times you see companies will focus on one aspect here, or maybe they're starting to move towards two about the data or the networking, the segmentation, you know, um, access through the cloud and understanding that type of stuff. And I think this is where the challenge is for an organization is to think about the strategy of how they would apply zero trust, because you're not going to be able to go to somebody commercially and say, I want you to do zero trust and here's my enterprise, go do that. You, you can't buy that right now. So you as an organization are going to have to have an understanding and have this information so that you can make reasonable decisions. Uh, NIST has the um, 800-207 is their zero trust architecture document. Very good. I think we I have references at the end of the presentation, but this is a good one to if you start to cut your teeth about understanding zero trust. And I really like this view because it kind of simplifies things to me. So if I look at the data plane there, you know, it's it's a person, a subject wants to access the system, they're untrusted. And we know that. And there's a policy and enforcement point there that is either going to be act just like a gate, either it's open or closed. And if it's closed, then I, I that person is trusted and can access that resource device. Given that that policy decision point up above here in the control plane says it's okay to do. So that that is what determines the gate there. And if there's talk about a policy engine policy administrator, but to me, I think it just like to keep it simple is there's a policy deficient point and there's going to be some type of mechanism that is going to take these inputs. And so you see along the outside in the gray boxes, here's just some of the inputs that would go into that policy decision point or for your, well, I guess, um, certs, the, the ID management, uh, data access policies. I think for the federal government, it's the continuous diagnostic mitigation system. So there's a number of different inputs that are going to be fed into this policy decision point. And that's where I think it's going to be key. And that's the dynamic part that makes zero trust security novel. Um, Here's another diagram, and I, I think this one helped me understand policy enforcement points. Um, talk about three different types, one dealing with the user agent, one at the network level, and one is an app at an application level. And as you see in this diagram, we show a little bit different inputs into that PDP. But I think it's important to, to kind of think about this as you look at your architecture, you understand, you know, what are the resources? what type of policy enforcement point could be put in front of those things. And then I think then you start to dig into things and better understand what you can do with what you have or if you need to purchase some other tools to help you out there. But this is, again, I think a really good view to, to make that point across that there's going to be these policy enforcement points that you need to think about having in your um, enterprise or your weapon system and things. So there's. Uh, well, 
there's a number of different models here that I'm going to show you. And I think when people talk about zero trust, they always, I guess, get in your mind when you kind of go back and you look, it's a one-to-one, -one, a pep to a resource. And it's like, a lot of times that's not practical in terms of whether it's an operational technology devices or network that you're dealing with. Maybe you're dealing with legacy systems or you're dealing with organizations that kind of merged and don't have all the things lined up together. So you have to have in your mind, well, what am I okay with being comfortable with for an implicit trust zone? And here in this diagram, it shows a path talking to just one resource. But if I go to the next one, here I, it's you think of it as an enclave, then you start to think about, well, I have multiple resources out there and I can only have one policy enforcement point in front of it. So I need from a security and a risk point of view, think about, am I comfortable with this? Or what do I need to do special in these types of engagements for a, a resource enclave like this? Um, there's a model that looks about expanding further and making use of the cloud, putting that PDP up in the cloud. And there's commercial products that give you that capability. But it's sometimes I know we have customers that they can't go out to the cloud. So it, it's a lot about understanding what environment you, you can work with, what tools you can use. So this is one that's more locus for those people moving to the cloud and can act, take advantage of those capabilities. Um, another one here is dealing with micro segmentation and that, that gets a lot of discussion in the zero trust strategies is how you segment your networks and being able to break it up to kind of reduce your risk. And again, you're thinking about that, that horizontal access that somebody can get an intruder can get into your network because they talk about north south is how somebody can get in but once they're in and they start raising their privileges then this is where the segmentation is really important to keep people isolated so this is another aspect people need to think about when they're considering zero trust the, the NIST document, 800-207 on zero trust architecture, identified these seven threats. And part of our research, we're going to be working to expand upon these and make these clearer to people. But I thought it was really nice to, to you know, they gave us a good starting point here. I think looking at the number seven, non-person entities, I think that was a new term. And it, those are the things in, like devices in your network. So it's not just people that you're looking at. You're looking at, you know, it's the phone, it's the printer, it's the surf. Thinking about that is what a non-person entity is. Um, but yeah, I think those risks are good. And here's some of the, the possible mitigations and things like this. So I think this is good reference for you all to look at later as you think about these things or consider this for your use. But I thought it was real handy to put it in here and make available to you guys. Um, yeah, but I will pause again. Was there any questions or anything? Okay, I will keep going then. So this is the part that we are working on. My team is, is focusing on, well, it's one thing that there's a, a standard out there and there's guidance. There's a lot of, I have, I've run across at least four zero trust maturity models that people want to, you know, assess themselves against to see, well, how am I doing in terms of security? But there's a, a real lack of any implementation type of guidance or how do I get started on this stuff? And I think this is what we're, we're developing, what we call our zero trust journey. And we talk about the need to have these four phases. But then another important part of my job is to help assess things. So um, I focus on being able to do an assessment across any of these phases to give a good understanding and having the right information available to be able to make that assessment. So I think th this is where we try to bring a little bit of different perspective because we focus on acquisition and getting the right requirements and understanding what should be when you purchase services or systems and things, what you should have in there in terms of the documentation or in terms of technical requirements. But the acquisition, the key part, as well as the technical 
decisions that you make and um, developing the appropriate documentation to support that is key. And that's with the engineering assessments. We try to show that as cross-cutting. So the, the um, prepare phase, I think we've had a lot of experience with um, CMM, CMMI, RMM, or a number of different models that have come out of the SCI that focuses on you have to build that support, do your work up front to be able to, to, to get you in a good position to transition to a new strategy like Zero Trust. So we think th there's an emphasis on, on identifying what is your strategy as an organization. I think people are starting to realize that Zero Trust, there's not going to be just one architecture out there that can be used by many people. It's unique for each organization. And I think this is where strategy is very important to understand what is important to you? What are your missions that you need to accomplish? What are the workflows? You know, what type of staff do I have? My capabilities? Am I going to do things in-house or am I going to outsource it? Those are all things that have to go into that strategy. So it's good to get us started on thinking about where am I? What are my capabilities as an organization? And that, that's what that step is deals with. Infrastructure is like to say that your as is. You have to know what you're working with, what you have currently, and then down in the roadmap is kind of. I want to have a plan for how do I get to where I want to get to. So that's my two B architecture, and the roadmap is the steps that I want to take to do that. To be able to do those things, I have to have a good understanding of my budget and what I can do in the time frame I have, as well as you have to provide good evidence and obtain that executive endorsement because just trying to be a champion within an organization, if you don't have that top cover and don't have that funding to support it, it's going to be a real struggle to try to make a change. So we think these are all important and we're in the process of um, we have a blog coming out as well as a podcast that kind of talks about the Zero Trust journey and provide a little bit more detail. But hopefully you guys will look for that in the future here. The, the next phase is called plan. And so normally organizations recognize the need to do asset inventories and data inventories. And that, that's good. There's a challenging already, but that's not enough. And so we are talking about adding three additional inventories in there dealing with subjects. And those are the non-person entities as well as the, the people themselves. So getting an inventory of who's doing what on your system. So that gets you down into that workflow. And then the data flow is dealing with, okay, I, I know what data I'm using my system, but how is it used throughout that system? So that kind of ties in with the workflow, the mission, and making sure that you have a good understanding of what my end products are and what it took me to get there, all the things that I needed to access. So that is something that we know that takes time. So I can't do all that before I take the next step. No, this is something that you, you have to get people to understand that you need to get this information. And we talked about doing pilots and things like that. And that, that's in the next step. But it, it, I, I just want to stress here, it's important to know that you need to start to do these things. System security engineering. This is where I, I like to look at the NIST 800-160 and the volumes one and two. I think being able to make decisions and um, understand what you want to protect is key. And I think that document is excellent. I really like to, myself, like to use contextual diagrams and use mission threads, or scenarios, and workflows and figure out, you know, what are my actors? What are those workflows? Who's doing what with what information? And I think we we're seeing that this ties in really closely with the that stack ops type of work that you hear people talking about in agile processes, but having a, a system security engineering approach to be able to look at this, document it, identify your trade-offs and your risk, and be able to make the decisions kind of helps you. Th this is taking that next step in that strategy and roadmap to know where you need to go and what to do next. The, the last thing was monitoring changes. So I think 
all these things are not something that you do once and put on a shelf. And I think we're trying to stress here, you need to be able to support the dynamic nature of what Zero Trust is talking about, is to be able to monitor when something changes in your inventory and get that, that policy associated with that to be able to feed the policy decision point when you're trying to do that access control for Zero Trust. I'll move it over to the, the third phase is assess. And this one kind of comes back to my cross cutting thing for engineering assessment is I need to have a way to look at somebody's vision, be able to look at their documentation, have methods to be able to assess it so I can identify what gaps we see and document that as well as identify the risk associated with what they're doing or what they're planned to do. And I'll talk later in this presentation about a couple assessments we use, but I think it's very important to build this in when you do your acquisition or you're developing your life cycle for a system is at the different review points, doing these assessments so you, you can have a good understanding of where you are, and what you need to do to get that desired end goal. We stress here the idea of doing pilot for these three inventories that I said were kind of special. Um, you don't want to start with the big bang approach on these things. That strategy has to be out there. What you did back in the prepare phase is to think about taking small bites, doing some pilots, and figure out which part of the system do I want to do something. Maybe you want to focus on consolidating your um, identity and access management system so that you can have one place that you look for that. Maybe you want to focus on um, your data and have a better understanding of that or segmenting your network. I think it all depends on what um, attacks, how you've been threatened in the past, and that kind of needs to go into your strategy and your roadmap. The last phase is implement. And so Policy development is very important, I think, for in terms of zero trust. I've mentioned that a few times now, but that's what you need to be able to have that in a, a way that it can be dynamic and it can feed into that policy decision point. Um, communicate and coordinate. I think sometimes people worry about when they talk of here in the zero trust and worrying about people having. Um, too much visibility of what you do. And I think these are the things that you, you want to help your organization understand why you're making these changes, how it's going to impact their workflows, what they can do, where they can do it. And it's not like it's, it's a, I mean, this is a good thing and it's helping people understand why it's good and why it'll make their life simpler is important. So I think that's a message that we want to get out there. The deploy and the operate is, again, taking your 2B architecture, and plans and having you know the the plans in place to deploy it and be able to operate and be able to monitor that monitor that information so identifying those metrics that you want to use to see how well you deployed how well that implementation is working is very important and i think change management is always something you just you have to have in this process because things are going to be changing dynamically so having a very clear process of how you do that, who can do what in that organization is important. So in my world, this is my journey that we're going to be working to expand, provide examples on. We're going to have a white paper here. I'm hoping uh, if I start a fall that provides more examples besides just what I talked about here. But I think this is really the area that people need to think about and to, to help them figure out where they want to get to. Here are um, some of the things that already exist. So a lot of times you don't have to go out and buy new things. These things exist in your system. So it's neat to see once you have an understanding what is your system and then what aspects of zero trust you want to focus on the tenants, then you can see what you can do. So this was just to give people an idea that, oh, no, I, I don't have to go out and buy a lot of stuff. A lot of times things are in place already that you can work with. I'll take another pause there. Oh, I do see there was uh, something in the chat. Uh, I guess I can just go do that. Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. That was very nice of you. Thank you for putting that there. Okay, if there's no questions, we'll keep on going, and then we can talk at the end.
questions. So one thing, we have a lot of different customers at the SCI. So we work with the DOD, we work with federal agencies, we work with commercial. And so me, I like to, to, get, to do a mind map to help me understand what it is, because each customer is going to be unique. And so I, I want to see what are those things that are, in, you know, making an impact on how I make a decision, how to help somebody, you know, provide that transition, figure out what works for that organization, as well as what I need to do to assess it. So OMB has some very good uh, memorandums out there that, that are driving the federal agency. I think that you Bryce heard about the presidential executive order and OMB put out M2209 is specific guidance for federal agencies of how they want them to move to zero trust and coming up with plans in a two-year time period. M2231 deals with logging and there's a lot of... Um, there's a maturity level associated with logging, four levels. And but you really need to be moving at the more mature levels of logging to be able to even start to think about applying some of the zero trust tenants. So those are two very key ones that I think from a, a federal agency point of view, people need to focus on. Um, I look down, DOD has some very excellent information about their zero trust reference architecture it is very specific and it helps you understand what actions that you need to be taking and when you look at zero trust i think it's an excellent resource for people to look at i think we've mentioned several of the nist documents already and um CISA is the is the uh, government's um for department of homeland security this is their cyber group that does their protections and there's a number of great documents out there helping organizations that even commercial ones can take the look at the information that's being developed to provide examples and apply those type of things. So what we're going to be doing in later this summer is we're going to be having a, an SEI Zero Trust Industry Day where we are going to take um, two of the OMBs, the two that I mentioned there, the M2209 and M2131, and we're going to develop a scenario that we're going to ask organizations to develop an approach that they would recommend for an organization to transition. And we're going to put in there like a budget and a time frame and some very specific requirements. So we're trying to get to the point where we can have different organizations provide their thoughts on how they would like to help people move to zero trust and addressing more than just, you know, one area like identity or uh, segmentation and the networks and things like that. So I ask that you guys please keep that in mind as you're thinking about, you know, how to do and learn more about zero trust in the future here. Um, we'll keep going because I, I know we kind of talk a lot, but here are some of the different maturity models that I talked about. Um, and I think that's the assessment part that you, you need to understand because if I'm in the DOD, well, there's a maturity model that they're expecting you to get to. And right down out there, there's not specific assessments that enable someone to do that. So you're right now it's, it's somebody with their expert opinion looks at the model, looks at an implementation and makes a judgment. And I think that's where we want to, to tailor some assessments to be able to do this for the different organizations. So to be able to do that, you have to understand the different maturity models and understand well, what, what's the point of emphasis for these different organizations. So I just listed a few of the different maturity models here. I won't tell you about you know, the specifics for them, but you have, this is another resource. I think the, the DOD, they kind of pulled the visibility analytics and the automation orchestration up to the same level as the user device networking application and data. But, you know, it, it's still, I think it's very good information. And I think it just depends on who you're talking to, what you're looking at for the maturity model, what you need to address. Um, yes, here's another one for theirs. NSA has a version for what they are looking for too in their customers. 
So I think this is getting near the end of my talk, but so we talk about different types of assessments and like to think of it in terms of a, a health check. We have something called a, and people can look at these to get an idea of the type of assessment here. But what we're trying to do is do something that you could do, like you go into a doctor. This mission risk diagnostic is something you could go. It's a very initial check at the beginning. And what this type of assessment is, is it's going to be focused on zero trust. And there'll be like 15, maybe 20 categories dealing with um, programmatic as well as technical questions that are asked to get an assessment at a high level of where, how well an organization is, is they're considering zero trust. And based upon that, we have two next level assessments that we use. This, the SARA, the Security Engineering Risk Analysis, is one that makes more use of the architectures, the workflows of scenarios and mission threats to be able to, to look at the interfaces, look at the people, the actions, and identify risk from more of a technical point of view. Over on the right side, there's the cybersecurity engineering review. And this is one that focuses more on the acquisition, that life cycle um, thought process and understanding what you need to do when you're developing your requirements, when you're making your specification, what you need to, should have in your RFP, as well as what those documents you should have at the, each of the review cycles in your life cycle and what that content should be to so be able to support um, assessments. And then both of those let us go down to do, you know, you can find where somebody might have a problem where you need to do code analysis of vulnerability assessments, penetration testing. So this is just kind of a, a my slide for how we do assessments and what we, why we think that you need to have something in these areas to be able to transition to a new technology like cyber, the zero trust security. Um, yeah, and so I've got acronyms here and we have the references, so I can leave it at that. Let me um, look at the chat and if it's all right with, um, okay, that's good. I don't have to deal with this. So I think I'm going to stop sharing and then, well, I won't stop sharing in case somebody has questions with a slide or something like that. So I was wondering if I could Jack, if it's good with you, if we could open it up to questions and yeah, uh, let's do that. And I maybe we could get get rid of a few that were uh, typed into the registration system first. Okay, would that be okay? Yeah, that's great. If you wouldn't mind reading it to me, then I'd be happy to. Do yeah, and maybe I had a couple similar uh, one from the, the defense industry and another one from uh, transportation, uh, public transportation and infrastructure. But they're both wondering at, at how, how does, does cybersecurity affect them? Uh, for example, in, uh, if you're a if systems engineer working in, um, in the defense industry, uh, what, what types of things would you expect to come your way and what, how would you possibly need to change uh, how, how you're doing your job and how, how, how does it affect your organization, your company? And then from the, in, this, in the same way, if, if you're, for example, working in the area of public transportation, uh, could, you, could you kind of compare and contrast how uh, cybersecurity and, might be managed differently and uh you know what are what are some of the important things uh in those industries and what might be different okay sure no thank you jack i appreciate that so like um the defense industrial base is something um, part of my team is supporting that effort of making it more secure. So I think we see a lot of times where you know we've had some tours foreign entity has access to, you know, um, our security clearance, or they have access to different uh, technical information from a corporation or things like that. So th that is where you start to think about, well, the things that I've kind of talked about 
you know, understanding your system, where your inputs are and things like that, and to securing like how you can access the system. Because a lot of times these phishing um, email, somebody clicks and that allows people to get into it. So it's, that's one part of the, the, the security concern is you're trying to improve, how the, uh, making it harder for someone to get access to your network. You need to think about segmenting your, your network or your enterprise to limit how people can get into that. That's another thought press. And then the supply chain aspects of things, what goes into what you're producing or what you're making, that's another key thing that you have to think about and consider the risk associated with that. You have to know, you know, what you're dealing with. What are the sources, you know, what's the, the software applications you're using? Where are you getting this information or these devices? I think those are all things that you have to think about from a, like a defense industrial base and consider those as threats or risks that you want to mitigate when you think about a zero trust, taking a zero trust uh, approach. From a transportation point of view, so I, I years ago I used to do um, commuter rail systems for a company here in Pittsburgh. And we had onboard control systems and we would communicate with the tracks and you, you have an, a number of different, it's more um, safety critical aspects of things. So you're trying to think about, I, I do, in my mind, I always thought about like how the door opens, you know, can you do certain operations? I think those are the things that you need to look at from a security point of view, because there's critical operations that you know that you need to address, but documenting them and figuring out how they could possibly be attacked is really important. So that, that, to me, that's a little bit different when you take in the, the safety critical nature for some of those things like that is that documentation and making that clear to people and then showing how you are addressing that or what you're doing to minimize your risk. I think that's very important. And so that's zero trust kind of place in that because you're looking at specific actions that you need to account for, but how you react and how you could support those actions, that's what that zero trust policy will help you improve the security. So I hope that addressed that, that question. Yeah, I think so. And uh, if, if, if uh, anyone wants to, to uh, expand on that, feel free to raise your hand or speak up. Um, uh, let's take another one. Uh, this is from Sabi in France. Uh, what, what do you feel are the, the main uh, principles for, in a nutshell, for assuring uh, cybersecurity? So, um, I... I like to think, so I, I, I'm shooting for a different model and we see this talked about in like the, the agile work when they talk about DevSecOps and the, the idea of a continuous authority to operate. So in that world, they wanna be able to say that I've got my security in place well enough that I can, I'm continually looking at it for that pipeline that I used to develop my software. And I think we need to apply that for our enterprises and our systems and things. So to do that, I need to have a good understanding of what I have, what are my assets, my data, how am I using that information? I think that's very critical in what you do. I think the access part that we've talked about earlier and focusing on that least privilege. So those are two key things that I think, but I think thinking about the things that you have to do for the security of systems. So different organizations have different compliance or requirements that they need to meet and thinking about well, what would make that life easier? Because I think that's the thing. A lot of times organizations do this check once, maybe a year, maybe every five years of checking their systems. I, I comply, I've got all the security controls in place. But that's not good enough now with the, the challenges we face. So getting in your mindset what you can do to move to be more dynamic and continuously looking at your security. But you have to start again with knowing what you have, your people, limiting access, 
and what type of operations. So more of a, a continual uh, learning and improvement. Absolutely. Pro it's, a, it's a process that's ongoing. Uh, here's one from Lewis in Georgia, and, and he was asking about blending uh, systems engineering and cybersecurity. And, and, and one area that, that I spotted was, was how 15288, uh, mm -hmm. which, which is the standard that our NCOSI handbook is, is based on. Uh, could you talk about how 15288 is, is blended in? Yeah, so, um, yeah, but I used to live 15288, that's for sure. It helped me figure out from an acquisition and understanding how you develop a system. And I think that's where looking at 800-160 for the system security engineering aspects, 15288 gets you a good understanding of what all you need to do for that life cycle from an acquisition, a technical and a support point of view. The, the 800-160 gives you the, the way to look at it from a security perspective and developing scenarios and identifying risk and making trade-offs. And I think the that's the tie in there because you, you have to have that base 15 to 88 understanding to be able to think of that system or system a system. But when you start to look at uh, 800, 160, that tailors you more towards the security and the risk associated. And it's not dealing at the compliance, just at the, the compliance level for security controls. It takes in the different quality attributes that you need to think about. And we know are very important when you develop that system. You know, do I have the accessibility needed? Am I able to adapt and adjust the changes quickly? So I think looking across those, getting that very basic 15288 understanding, then seeing how 800-160 focuses on the security aspects. And then we recommend using that as your basis for making decisions for a zero trust approach. Okay, and uh, there's one from Mark in Arizona about uh, applying the zero trust uh, principles in a data centric environment. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. So I think early on we saw when um, John Vander identified the, the reference model, he, they had data as central to everything. And it, it plays a very key part because, you know, to be able, you have to know what data you have in that system. You have to then control it. You know, it needs to be encrypted, whether it's, uh, at rest or in transit, you need to have to know who wants to use it. And that's when it is a uh, policy enforcement point needs to be in place between who wants to use it and that information to be able to say, oh, yes, that you can use it now and get access to that information. And then seeing where that data goes. So that's where the workflows that we talked about and the data work flows through the system, having that understanding of where your data is, how it's being used, by who, which applications, that's all very critical for Zero Trust. And it takes going to take organizations a while to get to that understanding. But yeah, that, that data is very key. But I hate to pick favorites, you know what I mean? Because some people like identity, some like the networks, but data is very critical. And I'm glad that question was asked. Yeah, I think it's nice how all of those uh, good things can we can combine and get the synergies out, out of all those good practices. I think, but that's the challenge too, because it's it's trade offs, right? And I think this is where the system engineering comes in. Is you have to have that contextual awareness of your system. You have to understand well, what are my constraints? What are my problems? What am I trying to accomplish? To, you know, to make money or meet my goal. And you, as that engineer, need to be that person that says, I, "Here's why I made this decision. Here's my information that supports that." Okay, thanks. Uh, we have. We have one in the chat from Terry in Canada. Can you see that one, 
Uh, yeah, let me just, yep. yeah, let me see. Uh, it must be up a little higher. And it, feel free to join in the discussion, uh, Terry, as well. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't see that. In my uh, okay, so it's. Uh, oh, there it is now. I got it. See it. Okay. okay. Yes. So zero trust independent to technology or is it dependent on technology? It is possible when Q. Yeah. Yeah. No, it. it so th to me, this is back. Yeah. The communications, whether it's Bluetooth, broadband, wireless, or those things, you know, you're still having somebody that needs to access, you know, make use of this transport mechanism, right? And so zero trust applies to the technology, but I can apply it. it I, you know, I guess I go back and forth on this. It's not dependent on it. Is the, the philosophies that we talk about understanding, you know, how to access information or how to access an application, that's independent of the technology. I think to understand the, the, the tenants and what you're trying to do to reduce the privilege, to make sure that what you people are trying to get at is secure, that's the, um, the, the, the zero trust consideration to have those things in your mind. But once you have that in your mind, then you have to look to see, well, what are the mechanisms being used? Am I you know, going from somewhere at Starbucks or if I'm doing you know, on-premise type of network? So I think it's, Developing that contextual awareness of your, your your application or your enterprise is important, but I think first you have to step back and think about those things from that system point of view, like fifteen two eighty eight, and then understanding the basics about zero trust tenants and seeing how that applies to, in this case, a specific communication. So I hope Terry that addresses your question. Uh, I, I think we've covered all the questions, uh, but we, we have a bit of time. So if, if you have a question, please uh, speak up now. No, yep, you're welcome. And, uh, yeah. I, I think we've uh, about covered it, Tim. Oh, that's good. No, I appreciate everybody taking the time to, to, to listen to this. I, I We'll say again, please look for more coming out in our area. We're going to be putting um, blog posts out. We're going to have a podcast on Zero Trust Journey. I mentioned the industry day that we're going to be having where, you know, once we get these organizations, we're hoping that they'll do a 30-minute presentation as well as some of the artifacts that they used to develop. And what we will do with this, as well as we're going to have some keynotes and panel discussions, but we will be developing additional papers about identifying best practices and different things to people. So, and then we also have a white paper that's going to come out that provides specific examples too. So there's more coming out in this area. So I appreciate if you kind of watch out for us, but thank you for the opportunity to talk to y'all. So thank you very much, Tim. And thank you everyone for attending. Uh, so with that, I think we'll adjourn and thank you. Thank you very much.